Namaste. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Glad to have everyone uh, gathered together here. We're glad to have everyone with us. Um, and our second experimental run uh, with online worship. Um, for those of you who are at home, uh, welcome. We're glad to have you with us. Uh, we have a skeleton crew of about six people here uh, to uh, make worship flow. A um, couple of technical notes. Um, hopefully you are all muted. Uh, that will make it easier uh, for things to, to flow and for you to observe what's going on and to not have a lot of feedback. Um, but uh, Dennis Brilo is also monitoring from home and has uh, hosting co-hosting abilities to hopefully keep track of that as well. Uh, and so I thank him for uh, monitoring things. Um, we'll also uh, say that uh, uh, we were unfortunately able to unable to make this work on Facebook this morning. I think um, it worked last night, um, but not this morning. I think. Um, probably because us and half the churches in the country are trying to uh, stream by Facebook Live this morning, so that might just have overwhelmed their bandwidth. Um, but uh, hopefully we will get that worked out uh, in weeks to come. Uh, a few other announcements uh, to share with everyone. Um, one is just a reminder that uh, this Zoom is how we're going to be doing a lot of our gatherings, our meetings. We will have midweek worship at 6.30 via Zoom, um, and I'll be emailing out the link for that um, and sharing it. Uh, if you don't, aren't on our church email list, um, feel free to reach out to me on Facebook uh, or by email, and I can get the link to you if you would like to join us for that. Uh, and um, we'll also be sharing, we've been sharing a lot of stuff via Facebook on our Facebook page and um, in our Facebook group. Um, so those are good places to check to see what's going on um, and what might be happening. Um, I'm also hopefully going to be starting to blog on a more regular basis. Um, so if you uh, are not already on that, there's a link to our blog, uh, to my blog on our church website. Uh, and uh, I will be sharing um, pastoral updates um, on that as well. Um, then uh, for worship today, um, if you were at home and uh, would like to make uh, an online offering um, during the offering, uh, you can do that. Uh, there is a link shared in the bulletin uh, that uh, we sent out. There, you can also go to martinlutherchurch.net, and if you scroll to the bottom of the page, you'll see Give, um, and you can click on that and, and give to us digitally. Uh, we certainly appreciate that. It allows us to continue to be the church, um, continue to have our resources available, um, and as we are working to um, care for one another in this time and also um, hopefully, going forward, uh, also be caring for people um, that may be in need of, of food and, and uh, other assistance as this, this rolls along. I <clears throat> uh, also want to share that the Mount Meru Coffee Project is continuing uh, to work, and um, they are still shipping out orders. Uh, they have announced that they are giving free shipping for the next month on orders over $15 so that they can try to continue to, to move their inventory. Uh, so if you go to um, then and make an order there, uh, if it's more than $15 in the Milwaukee area, I should say, uh, if you're watching from somewhere else, uh, it won't apply, but in the Milwaukee area, um, it will be uh, um, free if you order more than $15. Then finally, uh, I just want to say a big thank you to uh, Melinda Acarius. Um, she was signed up to, from our preaching team to preach for this morning. And um, so she is going to be sharing the sermon with us. And it ended up being a huge gift to me this week uh, to have one less thing um, to have to prepare for Sunday morning as I was rapidly learning how to do online worship and uh, connect with all of our people and make sure that uh, everything was uh, functioning at, at church and uh, within our synod. So thank you very much for um, doing that for me. She has a wonderful message uh, for us. Yes, Val. Um, I don't know if you guys can hear it, but you can translate. Yeah. Uh, I 
I will also, assuming all my technology works up here, I will be posting the entire service online as well on our website. All right, uh, Val said that uh, the entire service um, will be posted to our uh, website uh, later today or within 48 hours. Okay, so it will be available to be shared that way very soon. Um, those are the announcements that I have. Normally, we would say let us take um, a few moments of silence uh, at this time as we begin our worship, but I think, um, at least for the time being, um, for coming weeks, I think we're going to shift that a little bit to a time of peace. Um, I'm going to invite us all uh, to use this time uh, as a bit of an invocation. I want to invite all of us to take a deep breath. Then let it out. A lot of us are feeling stress feeling anxiety, um, we're feeling worried. And let us take a few moments to just breathe. And as we do this, remember that the word for breath in both Hebrew and in Greek is also the word for the spirit. And so let us breathe in God's spirit as we begin our time together. Let's breathe out our anxieties let us center ourselves for worship this morning. those who have access to the bulletin that was posted online, uh, we will now continue with the confession and forgiveness. Trusting in the word of life given in baptism, we're gathered in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us return to our gracious and merciful God, confessing our need for healing. Tender-hearted God, through the gift of baptism, you give new birth to your children by water and the Spirit. Yet we question your wisdom for us, thirst for what can never satisfy, and wander in the ways of death. Turn us again, O God. Forgive us our sin, gather us into your embrace, and teach us the way that we should go. Almighty God looks upon us with mercy and by water and the word joins us to the saving death of Jesus Christ. Through the Holy Spirit, God raises us with Christ to new life. I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us join together proclaiming God's word in song.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world. For the well-being of the Church of God and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Oh, Lord for this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Oh, Lord Help, save. Comfort and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Bend your ear to our prayers, Lord Christ, and come among us. By your gracious life and death for us, bring light into the darkness of our hearts and anoint us with your spirit. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading is from 1 Samuel. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse, Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Wait. Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, do you come peaceably? He said, peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Elio and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shema pass by. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, are all your sons here? And he said, there remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes, and was handsome. The Lord said, rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers 
And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Psalm 23 will be read responsibly. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. The Lord makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters. You restore my soul, O Lord, and guide me along right pathways for your name's sake. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup is running over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The second reading is from the fifth chapter of Ephesians. Once you were darkness, but now in the Lord you are light. Live as children of the light. For the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. Try to find out what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what such people do secretly. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, for everything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Sleeper, awake! Rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. for this extended story. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the ninth chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned that he was born blind. But in order that God's works might be revealed in him, we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, is not this the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, it is he. Others were saying, no, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been formerly blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, he put mud on my eyes, then I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. He said, he is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, 
Is this your son, who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. But we do not know how it is that he now sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. For the Jewish leaders had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said to him, he is of age, ask him. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind and they said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him saying, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born entirely in sins, and are you trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sin. But now that you say, We see, your sin remains. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Now I invite Melinda to carry us forward to give us the story. Good morning. When Pastor Ari sent out a list of possible gospel lessons for lay preachers, this lesson seemed to be speaking to me. I spent 45 years of my life in jobs related to children and adults who are deaf or hard of hearing. While many people in the deaf community don't see themselves as disabled, deafness is a characteristic that the majority of hearing people consider to be a disability. Certainly, like blindness, it's mentioned in the Bible as something Jesus cured. While this gospel lesson seems at first to be about Christ healing a physical disability, after reading all the way to the end, I realize that this gospel is not primarily about the man's blindness. Rather, I think the story is about everyone's disabilities, and in particular, our spiritual disabilities. This story is about us. All her life, people my mother respected and loved, her mother, her family, well-meaning friends, doctors, told her in one way or another that her struggle against overweight was the most important thing about her. The society of her time confirmed that message, <clears throat> and she was her own most rigid judge. When our family found out that my mother was dying of pancreatic cancer, my sister sent a note to every person in Mama's address box, probably about 400 people. If you want to tell Jane what she meant to you, now's the time, she wrote, and they wrote back. Mama read over 200 letters from people telling her that as a teacher, as an artist, as a folk singer, as a writer, as a community volunteer and leader, and as a family member, she had been important, transforming in their lives. 
Finally, overwhelmed. All she could say was, I thought none of that mattered because I was fat. We're all human beings and we all have human characteristics. There are characteristics that we don't want to have or that society tells us are undesirable or that challenge us. We may call these burdens or disabilities. The characteristics that we want to keep and enhance, we call gifts or abilities. As individuals, we can be described through our characteristics. And I'm gonna ask you to think about something honestly as it applies to you personally. If I asked you to describe yourself by making a list of your own characteristics, would the first item on the list be an ability or a disability? What if I asked you to list the characteristics of a family member or someone you know well? Would the first item on the list be an ability or a disability? And what if I asked you to list the characteristics of someone you don't know well, and that person clearly had a characteristic that you would tend to identify as a physical, cognitive, mental, emotional, or behavioral disability, even if the individual didn't see it that way? What would be first on your list? Might the disability even come before acknowledgement of the personhood of that individual? a blind man rather than a man who was born blind. In our gospel, we read about a man that was born blind. At least the man comes first, but being blind is the first characteristic we read about that man. It would be tempting to think that the story is about this man who is born blind, but I'm pretty sure it's not actually about the man's physical blindness. During my career, a very important lesson I learned was this. The individuals with whom I spent time were not inherently disabled. Rather, they tended to be disabled by how other people saw them. If we dig into the story, this first layer seems to be about a characteristic we could call spiritual blindness the spiritual blindness of the people around Jesus and the man who was born blind, particularly the disciples and the Pharisees. I think this story is partly about the other characters spiritual blindness, but the story is also about the impact of their spiritual blindness on others, on that man. A spiritually blind society, for example, had left this man no way to survive except by begging. At those times when we are spiritually blind, we perceive and focus on the disabilities of others rather than their total humanity. And in the same way, we may focus on our own disabilities, especially those which society tells us are shameful, like being overweight, rather than seeing our own humanity our complex completeness as a person. When we perceive a characteristic that we call a disability or in ourselves, in others, we may have a tendency as the disciples did to judge the cause and the consequences of that characteristic. Did the man or his parents sin that he was born blind? They asked Jesus. Today, we might ask a question like, why didn't that mother take care of herself during pregnancy? Why can't he stop eating or drinking or smoking? Or even, is it God who makes me out of control happy today and deep in a pit I can't climb out of tomorrow while the people around me keep telling me I could cheer up if I just tried? After Jesus healed the man, the man's neighbors disagreed about whether he was still the same person. They were spiritually blind. When one characteristic changed, they couldn't see that all the rest of his humanity remained the same. He continually reminded them, I am the man. I am still a man, the same man, in other words. 
How can you be, they wonder, when you no longer have that characteristic that we use to identify you, to pity you, to condescend to you, to blame you. When Jesus restored the man's vision, the Pharisees, in their spiritual blindness, focused not on the healing that had occurred, but on the fact that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. Their spiritual blindness trapped them in a net of rules and laws, and in consequence, they trapped others in the same net. The man's parents, for example, were afraid to discuss what had occurred for fear of being expelled from the synagogue, even though they probably understood the miracle and their son better than anyone else in the story, except Jesus and the man himself. And the man whom Jesus cured? The Pharisees' rejection of him sent him right into the arms of Jesus as a follower, just the consequence the Pharisees did not want. And that consequence reminds us of the good news of this story. Now, you'll notice if you look at your bulletins at verses three and four of the gospel lesson, Pastor Ari didn't read them the way they're written. In the bulletin, it says, Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, semicolon, he was born blind, so God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day, night is coming when no one can work. However, what Pastor Ari said, and he was winging it, so I'm not going to be, it's not going to be a direct quote, Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, period. End of that thought. But so God's works might be revealed in him, the blind man, it is necessary to do those works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. With the change of a semicolon to a period, we see that Jesus shifts our attention away from the man and towards God's act of healing, done in the light of day, using the material at hand, someone who needed obvious physical healing, as a symbol. In this alternative translation, God's work wasn't to make the man blind, just to show his power. God's work was the work of spiritual healing right here, right then, in the daylight, in front of the people who needed this lesson about what God can do. Jesus demonstrated by healing the blind man that God has the power to open the eyes of the spiritually blind. God opens our eyes. God does not necessarily remove our disabling characteristics. Not all the people who were blind in Jesus' time Excuse me, let me start that again. Not all the people who were blind in Jesus' time regained their sight. My mother remained a compulsive eater. When she found out she was dying, one of her reactions was, now I'm going to eat anything I want. But God as the Holy Spirit can enter and heal every one of us in ways that matter, allowing us to perceive others and ourselves as entire individuals through the eyes of the Holy Spirit. God entered the hearts of all those letter writers in answer to my sister's note. And in the end, my mother saw herself as they saw her, a complete individual. What she had perceived as a disability did not condemn her. She was granted spiritual sight. We are all granted spiritual sight if we use it a spiritual sight shows us God's grace. As God allows us to accept all of our human characteristics and to see ourselves as God sees us, we learn to look at ourselves without seeing any particular characteristic as necessarily positive or negative. In the same way, God allows us to see our neighbor without just judgment as a complete person. We see our neighbors through the eyes of the Holy Spirit. 
Through spiritual sight, we respond to the totality of any human being, including ourselves. We share light and loving support through our words and actions and through our relationships with our neighbors as children of God, regardless of any single characteristic. The man who had been blind became a follower of Jesus. He saw clearly the consequences of his choice. He had already experienced some of them, such as rejection from the synagogue. But as a person, not a man whose defining characteristic was a disability, he could join and identify with others who were searching for spiritual healing. If we have spiritual sight, can we see ourselves <clears throat> as individuals who follow Jesus? Maybe we don't need to make a list to understand ourselves. Maybe even more important, can we refrain from making lists about our neighbors? Or about the public figures we only know secondhand through the eyes of others who may also be spiritually blind? And how may our lives and the world change if we use spiritual sight to guide all our actions and interactions? God granted my mother the chance to see herself through the spiritual sight of her friends, her former students, her extended family, her children, and her husband. One blessed consequence of her enlightenment was that I, who share many of her characteristics, including overweight and a sometimes rigid and narrow self-judgment, got to watch her transformation. I was able to see myself in new ways, at least some of the time. At those times when I can remember the lesson, what a change it makes in my life, how I look at myself, how I look at others through the eyes of the Holy Spirit. God grant that gift in abundance to all of us.
we do the Apostles' Creed, uh, if I may have a moment of commentary, thank you, Melinda, for such a wonderful message and a reminder of our need to overcome our spiritual blindness, especially in these days, um, as we need to look out and see the, the need and uh, face God and the people around us. Thank you. With the Apostles' Creed, um, since we are separated physically uh, this morning, I've taken the liberty to change one small word. Instead of saying, I believe, uh, we're going to say, we believe, as a reminder that we are still community. Even if we can't be together physically, that we are still one body of Christ gathered together around the promises and the presence of Jesus Christ. So let us join together in confessing our faith, the faith in which we are baptized and made the body of Christ using the words of the Apostles' Creed. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We'll continue with our prayers. Turning our hearts to God, who is gracious and merciful, we pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. God of insight, open our hearts and the hearts of the church and the whole world to all who testify to your deeds of power. Raise up voices in your church that are often silenced or overlooked due to age, gender, expression, race, or economic status. Hear us, O oh God. Your God of insight, empower us to care for the land and all living things that dwell in it and beneath it. Provide rich soil for crops to grow. Bring rain to land suffering drought. Protect hills and shorelines from damage caused by erosion. Hear us, O oh God. Your, Your mercy, mercy is great. Right. God of insight, bring peace to all people and nations. Anoint leaders who seek goodness, righteousness, and truth on behalf of all. Frustrate the efforts of those who would seek to cause violence and terror. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of insight, you care for our needs even before we ask. Come quickly to all who seek prayer this day. We pray especially for Catherine Brown, J.R. Smith, Nancy Thurston, Tiana Stewart, Jackie Nestor, Diane Melton, Wes Piercy, Declan Halloran, Kim Zucker, Karen LeMay, Dan Bowling, all those impacted by COVID-19, those on the Christ Care list, those in the community groups that meet here, and for those we name now, whether out loud or in the silence of our hearts. For those who lost their jobs, Accomplish healing through the work of doctors, nurses, physical therapists, nutritionists, and all who tend to human bodies. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of insight. Help this assembly lift up the unique gifts each person who enters, no matter their physical capacity, cognitive ability, or sensory need. Help us be creative and brave in making our facilities and our ministries accessible to all. Hear us, O oh God. Your, your mercy, mercy is great. Help us to rejoice this day for your gift of life, which we have received by your grace and the new life you give in Jesus Christ. 
We especially thank you for our partner ministries and our relationships with St. Therese, Redemption, and the Milwaukee Mennonite Church. We thank you for many blessings and for those things we name to you now. Families and friends, for healthcare workers, for emergency responders, for grocery workers, for postal workers, for those who are working in your time. Hear us, O oh God. Your, Your mercy is great. God of insight, you call out to those who are asleep and awaken them to new life with you. We give thanks to your saints. Join us together with them as your children in this world and next. Hear us, O oh God. Your, your mercy, mercy is great. According to your steadfast love, O oh God, hear these in all our prayers as we commend them to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 <clears throat> This time, it is uh, time for us to share the peace. Um, and uh, so in order to do that, uh, I'm going to invite everyone to unmute yourself uh, momentarily uh, and let us together in one voice uh, be able to speak peace to one another in this time. So the peace of the Lord be with you all. And also, and also with you. you. With you. Peace, everybody. Peace to everyone. With you all. Peace. Peace. Oh, there's the silos. Great digital hugs going out to everyone. <laughs> yes. Now I invite you to mute yourself again. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and uh, a reminder that uh, we are receiving offerings digitally, and uh, those who wish can go to our website, uh, martinlutherchurch.net, scroll to the bottom, and go to Give Now, and uh, you can give there. Um, help us to continue to be the church. Help us to continue to move forward um, and to be a place that has resources to support and care for one another. Um, we know that a lot of things are up in the air. A lot of things are going to change and have changed already. Um, and we as a church are committed to being a place of healing, being a place of support and comfort to those that need it uh, today and in the weeks ahead. Uh, and your gifts make that possible. So thank you very much. Now, we received quite a few uh, questions, or I did, about communion, um, how we do communion uh, since we are separated like this. Um, unfortunately, we are not able to do communion digitally um, for many theological reasons that I will not get into right now. Um, but uh, after discuss, discussion with some colleagues and doing some uh, exploration and study this week, um, I did find this practice of spiritual communion, um, which is more common in the Episcopal and the Roman Catholic Church, um, and is intended for those who are, for whatever reason, unable to physically receive uh, the sacrament of communion it is a prayer where we pray for Christ to be gathered with us, uh, for Christ to come within our lives and to be physically present to us, even if we cannot hold the, the, the bread and the wine, the blood and, and body of Christ himself. So for uh, this practice, uh, I'll invite us all to um, pray along. And for those who may have uh, water handy, um, I'll, where it's indicated in the prayer, I'll invite you to use water to mark the cross of Christ on your forehead as a reminder of our baptism, where we are bound to Christ, to his death and resurrection, now and always. So together, let us pray. Jesus, my Savior, I believe that you are present in the sacrament of communion. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you in my life. Since I cannot at this moment receive you physically, come into my heart and soul and mind. Embrace me with all of your strength so that I might embrace you and unite myself wholly to you. Never allow me to be separated from you. Amen. Lord Jesus, remember us in your kingdom and help us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. As I say the benediction, I'm reminded that uh, the words of the benediction are originally spoken by Aaron to God's people. Uh, Aaron, the first uh, priest of, of the Hebrews, while they were out in the wilderness, while they were in unknown territory, words of promise that God was with them and cared for them in that in-between place as they were on their way to something better. And so, with the words of Aaron, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Let's sing our closing hymn. Remember the poor. Thanks be to God. 
Amen. God's peace be with you all. God's, God's peace, everybody. Have a good day. God be with you all. Stay well. You too, Ari. Peace to everybody. Yes. Thank you. you too. Peace, everyone. Thanks, Pastor. Peace, everyone. Thank you. By my count, there were almost 100 people in church today. Wait, wow. that's awesome. Peace. That's great. Very <laughs> Good to see all the faces. Thanks. Take care, everyone. See y'all next time. <laughs>